Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill It's good to be back in the auditorium. The stage certainly looks different, doesn't it? It's so minimalistic now. It was, <laughs> there was so much going on up here before for BBS. But we're glad to be back here, and I'm glad that you are here tonight. Our, this summer series has been such a blessing for our congregation and hopefully for our community, too. And speaking of that, if you're our guest tonight, we are so thankful that you are here. We want you to come back and be with us any and every opportunity you get. We have a lot going on here. God is doing great things. We'd love for you to be a part of what God is doing here. So please come back. We will have a cookie fellowship afterwards tonight. So that's good news. That'll be out in the quad there. And we hope that you'll st uh, stick around and enjoy some cookies and some fellowship together. Well, as we continue tonight to think about and to talk about the Lord's Prayer Tonight, you're going to be blessed to hear Wes McAdams. Wes is the preaching minister for the Church of Christ at McDermott Road in Plano, Texas. He's been there since 2016. Was that a shout out or a cheer? Oh, we got a, we got a cheer for Plano, Texas. <laughs> Wes was also in Midland and Abilene and Arkansas. So, you know, Plano is a little bit different than those places. So, deserves the shout out, I guess. His family is here, Holly and... Their two boys are here as well. You'll want to meet them afterwards. One of the things I want to tell you about Wes is he has a, a blog and a podcast called RadicallyChristian.com. Is that right? RadicallyChristian.com. And there's some great content there. I would encourage you to check that out sometime. He's also written a book, um, and you would be interested in that. But that, that podcast is great. He interviews some interesting people with some interesting perspectives, and it's always a, a great uh, biblically-based application for our challenges uh, today in this world, and we know that we have many, and so you would be blessed by checking that out as well. He's going to continue, as I said, as we think about the Lord's Prayer, specifically with that phrase, lead us not into temptation. And so certainly there's application there for us. And so let's offer a word of prayer, and then we'll sing a couple more songs, and then Wes will come up and bless us with his message from God's word or God's message through us tonight. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you so much for being a, 
loving, merciful, faithful God. Father, we are thankful for prayer, that we can simply open our hearts and our mouths and our minds to you, and that you hear and respond. Father, that you care about the things that we're thinking about, the praises that are on our hearts and minds, the struggles that we have. Father, it is our prayer that your will is done here among us, through us, in us, as it is in heaven. Father, it is our prayer that you would provide for us daily. It is our prayer that your kingdom would come as it continues to come and that we would be a part of what you're doing. Father, it's our prayer that you would lead us through temptation on the other side. Father, help us to see you, to see what you're doing, to see you working around us, and to be a part of what you're doing. Father, we pray for Wes as he shares with us tonight. We're thankful uh, for him and being with us, for his family. We pray your blessings over them, his ministry at McDermott, and his ministry online as well, Father. As we continue to give you praise, we thank you for Jesus, for who he is, for what he has done, and for how he leads us each step of the way, Father. We pray this and give thanks in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. If you would, please be standing. I love you, Lord, oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay. Every breath that I 
Good evening. When God took Israel out of Egypt toward Canaan, toward the promised land, he didn't take them on the shortest route possible. There was a shorter route that he could have taken them, but he didn't go in that direction because he knew that if they went in that direction, they would have to face the Philistines. And if they faced the Philistines, they would have to fight the Philistines and they weren't ready for that. God knew that they were too weak for that. God knew that they couldn't handle that. And he knew that if they had to fight right after coming out of Egypt, they would just turn around and go back to slavery. And so God led them the long way around. God led them the long way around. And I want to suggest to us tonight that sometimes, sometimes the best thing that can happen is for God to lead us the long way around. And maybe, maybe that's what's going on in your life right now. And maybe you can't see that right now. Maybe you won't be able to see that until after the fact. But maybe, just maybe, God is leading you the long way around because he knows that the other way would be disastrous for you. I want to say before I go any further tonight, thank you. Thank you for Randy inviting me to be with you tonight. Thank you for being here. I always tell the church wherever I go, I love you. And, and I don't know most of you. I've seen a few of you that I know and I, I love for very specific reasons, but I love all of you because you're my brothers and my sisters in Christ. I love you because in the middle of the week, in the middle of the week, you're, you're studying scripture together. You're with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think that's amazing. I know you have a lot going on in your life. So the fact that you would make time for your church family, make time for God, make time for Bible study is phenomenal. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. But thank you for being you. Thank you for allowing God to use you here in Edmond in all the ways that he's using you. This church I've heard so many great things about over the years, so it is my pleasure and my honor to be here tonight, and I want you to know that I love you. We're talking about this phrase, five words, lead us not into temptation. And this is a phrase that is, is kind of controversial. It's kind of uncomfortable. Sometimes we don't know what to do with this, that Jesus would teach his disciples, would teach his followers, both the followers in the first century, but this prayer would continue to be prayed by God's people for 2,000 years. And sometimes we wonder, what, what do we do with this phrase in particular? Are we really supposed to pray this, lead us not into temptation? What does that imply about God? What, what are we implying about God when we say, God, don't lead me into temptation? Why, why would we need to pray that? In fact, in fact, it makes some people so uncomfortable. In 2019, the Pope actually authorized the, the changing of the wording, that they changed it from lead us not into temptation to do not let us fall into temptation. And I get it, right? I understand that inclination that we would say, this is this is kind of uncomfortable. Are we saying that God would lead us into temptation if we pray this? And what does that imply about God? But I think we ought to stick with the text as it's written, don't you think? I think we should stick with the text and just try to understand what, what does Jesus mean? So first of all, tonight I want to talk about what does this phrase mean? And then secondly, why, why should we pray this? Why should we keep praying this? Why should you pray this every day? Father, lead us not into temptation. And finally, how is God answering it? How does God answer this prayer? We, we believe God does, don't we? We believe God answers prayer. So what does it mean? Why should we pray it? And how is God answering it? That's where we're going to go tonight. So first of all, what does it mean? So let's kind of walk through these five words. And I've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks just kind of walking through these words and thinking, what, what does Jesus mean by this? Lead. That's the first word, right? Lead, at least in English. Lead. Lead. What, what does that mean? And the, the, the Greek word there could also be translated as 
carry into. So it, it could be translated as carry us not into temptation or bring us not into temptation. Some of the other times this same word was used was like when the paralyzed man, do you remember his friends were bringing him to Jesus? They were carrying him to Jesus. They were trying to bring him into the house, but it was too full. That's the idea here. Or in fact, Paul says that we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. This, the same word, bringing it in, we've brought nothing into the world. So this is the word that Jesus is using when he says, pray, pray this way. Father, carry us not into temptation. Bring us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. In fact, this idea of God bringing us somewhere or carrying us somewhere or leading us somewhere, this is, this is all throughout Scripture, isn't it? This is what it is to be part of God's family. In fact, going back to that Exodus idea, God led them. God led them out of Egypt and to the promised land. He led them as a pillar of cloud or pillar of fire, and he led his people. He was with them intimately. He camped out with them. And that, I mean, that just boggles my mind. Doesn't it yours? That the creator of the universe, the I am, the almighty one, he, he wanted nothing more than to be with his people to lead them like a shepherd leading his sheep. In fact, most of us probably know the 23rd Psalm by heart. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your namesake. We want God, don't we, to be our shepherd. This is what it is and what it means to be God's people is to be led by him to be carried by him. Because sometimes the, the leading, the leading is more like carrying, isn't it? He's carrying his people. He's bringing them somewhere. He's leading them somewhere. So inherent in this message, implied in this phrase, lead us not into temptation, is that God is leading us somewhere. God is taking us somewhere. God is bringing us somewhere. God is carrying us somewhere. But notice also that it's not lead me into temptation. What is it, church? What's the next word? Lead us. Lead us not into temptation. Now, I know you've been going through this, the Lord's Prayer, and so maybe you've talked about the fact that these requests, this prayer is worded in the plural, isn't it? It's worded in the plural, but do we always think of it that way? That it isn't just God is leading you. It isn't just that God is leading me. It isn't that God is just carrying me or bringing me or taking me somewhere. He's leading us somewhere. He's taking us somewhere. He's bringing us somewhere. And here's what I think. I, I, I think sometimes we need to get away from the I and me prayers and move into the we and us prayers. Move away from just praying I and me and move towards praying us and we. Because Christianity is a group effort, isn't it? Yes, you have to make decisions on your own. And, and listen, God loves you. He's crazy about you. He knows you. He knows every hair on your head. He loves you and he knows you. But we are doing this together. And we don't just pray, Father, give me my daily bread. We pray, Father, give us our daily bread. We don't just pray, forgive me my trespasses. We pray, forgive us our trespasses. We don't just pray, Father, lead me not into temptation. We pray, Father, lead us not into temptation. It's, it's not wrong to pray I and me, but sometimes we need to start praying us and we, don't we? And we need to remember that we are praying on behalf of one another. 
I mean, what if we really took that seriously? I often think about the Apostle Paul, and, and Paul, I mean, he knew that Jesus loved him, like Jesus loved Paul, and he knew that. I mean, he saw Jesus, he heard from Jesus, he talked to Jesus. He knew that Jesus loved him, Paul. But he also believed that the success of his ministry, his missions, it depended on other people praying for him. And do we, do we think about that that way? Do we think about the fact that my, my life depends on you praying for me? Your life depends on other people praying for you. The life of your brother and sister, it depends on you praying for them. What if we took responsibility to be really praying for each other and we stop just praying I and me and we start praying us and we and we recognize that we have an obligation to pray, Father, lead us not into temptation. You're taking us somewhere. You're leading us somewhere. You're carrying us somewhere. Us as in you and your family, us as in the Edmund congregation, us as in the, the church in the United State, States, us as in the church in the world, together as God's people, he's, he's doing something for us and with us and to us, isn't he? And we have to recognize that Jesus wants us to partner with each other and with him in praying for each other. Father, lead us not into temptation. Let's talk about that next phrase or that next word, temptation, not into temptation. Now, that could have a couple of different meanings. One, it could be like a, a trial. It's like a really hard time, a testing. And, and I love that word test. Because when we a test, we, we could talk about a test as in, this is really testing me, or you could talk about a test like you go to school and you take a test. It does the same thing, doesn't it? It reveals something. And when you've gone through a difficult time, a hardship, a struggle, it reveals something about your character. It reveals something about your strength. It reveals what you know. It reveals what you don't know. It reveals your weaknesses. Again, when God brought Israel out of Egypt and was taking them towards Canaan, he knew they're not strong enough for the shortcut. They're not strong enough right now to face the Philistines. They're not strong enough for that trial. They're not strong enough for that test. God knew his people and he knew they would fail that test. So sometimes when we talk about a temptation, we're just talking about a, a trial, a hardship, a difficulty, a test. But also we could use temptation as we normally think of it as something or someone that's enticing us to sin, to do something that's wrong. And hard situations can do both, can't they? They can show that we're weak, like, I just want to give up and go home kind of a thing. And a hardship can also reveal our moral weakness in that we give in to temptation and we do what is wrong. And that's what we're praying for God not to do. Don't bring us into those types of situations. Don't take us through those types of situations. So let's talk about this question. Why should we pray this? Why should we pray this? Why, why should we pray, Father, lead us not into temptation? I think a, a couple of different reasons, at least. One is that we're recognizing, we're recognizing our weakness, aren't we? Not just my weakness, oh, and I'm weak. I'm weak, and I need to pray this for me, that's true, but, but also the weakness of all of us. And it's keeping us humble, isn't it? By praying this, we're, we're saying, Father, I know, I know that if the test is bad enough, is hard enough, I know 
we'll fail. And we don't want to fail. We don't want to fail. We want to please you, Father. We want to do what is right. We don't want to, we don't want to turn around and go home. We don't want to give up. We don't want to fall into sin. We don't want to disappoint you. We don't want to rebel against you. We want to do what is right, and we want to do what is good. And so don't lead us into a testing situation because there's a good chance that if we go into a situation like that, we will fail the test. So, Father, lead us the long way around. Lead us the long way around. Don't give us any shortcuts, because I don't know if we can take it. We have to pray things like this, don't we? We have to pray things like this so that we keep our weakness at the forefront of our mind. Because all too often we say, bring it on, bring it on. I, I, I won't fail. I'll, I'll do what's right. I won't give up. I'm tough. I'm strong. You remember Peter? You remember Peter? the night that Jesus was betrayed? And do you remember all of the apostles? What did Jesus say? You're, you're all going to run away from me. And Peter, you're going to deny me. Peter says, never. I would never do that. He should have been praying this prayer, shouldn't he? Father, lead us not into temptation because we're weak. But it also, praying this prayer is a constant reminder that we are being led and that we need to be led, that we need to be brought, that we need to be carried, that we need to be taken. Because what's the alternative to that? If we're not praying, Father, lead us not into temptation, then we forget that we are sheep and sheep need to be led. Otherwise, they lead themselves, and that never ends well, does it? Sheep are incapable of leading themselves. They need a shepherd, and so do we. He is our shepherd. He is our good shepherd. He wants to lead us. He wants to lead us with mercy and with wisdom he knows. He knows what you can take and what you can't take. He knows what you can handle and what you can't handle. What he needs for you to do is to keep that at the forefront of your mind, for me to keep that at the forefront of my mind, to say, Father, we need to be led. But don't lead us into a situation where we might fail the test because we want desperately to please you, yet we are still so very Weak. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 13. Here's what Jesus' little brother James says about temptation. He says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts one. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desires. By his own what? desires, by his own desires. That's, that's where the temptation is coming from. The enticement, the allurement to sin and to rebel against God, it's coming from our own desires. It's not coming from God. He's not the originator of temptation. God isn't trying to entice you to sin. We sin because we are lured away. We are enticed by what we want to do, our own appetites, our own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. See, this, this is when we end up sinning, isn't it? It's not, it's not God's fault. When we end up sinning, it's not, God, you, you did this to us. You did this to me. You brought me here. You led me to this. Nope. When I end up sinning, it's because I was following my desires rather than his. Isn't that right? It's because I was leading me instead of him leading me. And see, this is especially pertinent and relevant in our culture, isn't it? Because we live in a, in a highly individualistic culture, in a, in a culture that is consumeristic, 
where we tell people, do whatever you want to do, have whatever you want to have, you be you, you do you, you follow your own heart, get whatever you want to get and hold on to whatever you have. Lead yourself, think for yourself, be yourself. And yet James says, no, no, see, that's that's when you end up in sin. It's when you are dragged away and enticed by your own desires. This is what we have to learn to deny. And in fact, this is what the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray can help us remember to do. To say, Father, I need you to lead me. I can't lead me. We, us, we need you to lead us. We can't lead ourselves. If we lead ourselves, we'll lead ourselves right off a cliff. If if we lead ourselves, we will lead ourselves into death and destruction. But if you lead us, you know us better than we know ourselves. You know our weaknesses. You know the trials we can handle and the trials we can't. So you lead us not into temptation. We're trusting you. We're surrendering ourselves to you. This is why we pray prayers like this, isn't it? So that we remember we are individually and collectively weak We are individually and collectively incapable of leading ourselves. And we need our Father to lead us. We need to surrender ourselves to Him. So we have this reminder to pray. Don't lead us into temptation, but lead us. Lead us, carry us, take us, bring us. Let us follow you, and we're going to trust you that where you take us will be green pastures, that you will lead us beside the still waters, that your rod and your staff, they'll comfort us, that even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because you're with us. We're going to trust you that you're going to lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. But lead us, Father, lead us. Just don't lead us into temptation because we're weak. See, in our very core, so many of us don't believe that, do we? We don't believe that we're weak. We don't believe that our desires need to be mortified. We we think that our desires need to be fulfilled. We don't listen to James. We don't listen to Paul. We don't listen to Jesus. But this prayer reminds us that we need to be led, and he's the only one, he's the only one who will not lead us into temptation. Everybody else will. You follow the crowd, they'll lead you into temptation. You follow yourself, you will lead yourself into temptation. Worse than that, you'll lead yourself into situations that you can't handle. And we all have, haven't we? That's that's what we all have in common. We, We have a lot of differences. But that's one of the things we all have in common. You've led yourself where you shouldn't have gone and done things you shouldn't have done. And Jesus offers to not only forgive us, but to transform us and to allow his Father to lead us. In fact, that'll take us to our next question. How is God answering this prayer? How does God answer this prayer? If we believe God is listening to us and loves us and that this prayer isn't just cathartic, it isn't just a reminder of what we're supposed to think about and do, but we're actually talking to God and God is actually actively answering us. How is God answering this prayer? It it doesn't mean, of course, that that all of the, the struggle will suddenly disappear. Father, lead us not into temptation. And then all of the struggle goes away. All of the trials go away. All of the hardship goes away. That's that's not the way God answers this prayer, is it? That's not even really what we're asking for. Here's five ways that God is answering this prayer. Number one, by not allowing us to be tempted beyond our ability. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, isn't it? He says, no temptation, no temptation 
has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful. That's a good word, isn't it? God is faithful. That's why we pray, Father, lead us not into temptation. Because we know God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Your ability to endure it, to go through it. He knows what we're capable of and what we're incapable of. He knew that Israel, they can't handle the Philistines right now. They can't handle the shortcut right now. See, there's so many times in our life where we say, well, God, how come you don't give me more money? Maybe the answer is, you can't handle it right now. Wait, why don't you give me this? Why don't you give me a better relationship? Why don't you give me this? Why don't you give me a better job? Why don't you give me whatever? And maybe the answer is, he knows you too well. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. And if you're trusting him, Father, don't lead me into temptation and you're trusting and you believe that he's faithful and he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear, but will, next part, number two, provide a way of escape from every temptation. That's what the rest of the verse says. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's, that's what we're praying for, isn't it? When we, when we pray, Father, lead us not into temptation, we're saying, give us, give us a way to avoid sin. We, we want to please you, Father. And we are incapable of leading ourselves. And, and we trust you to lead us, to bring us, to take us, to carry us. But every situation into which you carry us, every situation into which you lead us, we're going to be looking for that way of escape. We are, if, if we are letting him lead us. See, this is why we have to pray, lead us not into temptation, because otherwise we'll lead ourselves. And when we're leading ourselves, we're not, we're not looking for the way of escape. We're looking for the way of fulfillment. We're looking for the way of indulgence. We just want to scratch that itch. But when we're constantly praying, Father, Lead us not into temptation. Then it reminds us of his faithfulness. And God is actively answering this prayer and providing for us a way of escape. And the more we pray it, the wider maybe that escape is. And the more we will see it and see the, the lights pointing to it and say, this is it. Go this way. Don't go that way. Don't follow your own appetites. Don't follow your own desires. Here's the way of escape, to do what is right and do what is good in spite of the difficult situation. Number three, by only allowing us to face trials that are for our good. Like, do we, do we believe that? Then we're saying, Father, you're our, our good shepherd. Jesus, you are our good shepherd we are your sheep, and you are leading us, you're carrying us, you're taking us, you're bringing us. And so whatever it is that we are going through as we trust you and we faithfully behind you in paths of righteousness, we're trusting you that whatever it is we go through, we can consider it all joy. So James says, doesn't he? He says, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith, you're going to go through trials. You're going to go through hard times. Even if you pray, lead us not into temptation, you're going to go through tempting times, trying times, testing times. But you know, your faithful father, father is leading you. And whatever it is that he's leading you through, you're going to have to endure it. You're going to have to persevere through it. But it's going to make you better. It's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you more capable of handling temptation. Know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, when we're actually following our Father, 
when we're actually following Jesus and we go through a trial and a hardship, we can know he didn't bring us here to entice us. He brought us here to grow us. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Do we believe that God allowed me? God didn't make this happen necessarily, but God is allowing me to go through this, allowing us to go through this, not to entice us to sin. Temptation doesn't come from God. It comes from our own desires. But God is allowing us to be at this moment, not to entice us, but to grow us. And then if we'll consider it all joy, and keep our eyes fixed on him and follow him and keep praying, lead us not into temptation, then we can consider it joy because we know that going through this is actually going to make us stronger. Number four, he's training us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Paul says in Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11, he says, for the grace of God has appeared. God's grace has appeared, and His grace is bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. We don't, we don't often think about grace training us, but Paul says actually the grace of God has shown up and this appearing of grace trains us to renounce ungodliness. Why? Because we've been set free. You're not a slave to what you did before. You're not a slave to where you've been before. You're, not in, you're no longer in bondage to where your passions led you before. You don't have to follow them anymore. You are free. And so now this freedom that you've received, this gift that you've received, that now you, regardless of where you've been, regardless of what you've done, you are God's children. He sent his son to die for you, to adopt you into his family, to make you citizens of his kingdom. And this grace that he's extended to us, it teaches us to say, I don't want to do what I did before. I don't want to go back down that path that I went down before. Don't you know that when Paul preached the message of grace, that there were so many religious people saying, come on now. You can't just go around telling these Gentile people, these pagan people, these idol-worshiping, sexually immoral people, these pork-eating people, you can't tell them that they are adopted into God's family by God's grace as a gift. Well, what are they going to do with that? So Paul says in Romans 6, do, do we just go on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. No, you've been set free from that. Why would you go back to that? Haven't we learned where we end up? Didn't the prodigal son learn where he ends up, that he ends up in the pigsty when he follows his own desires and passions? And when he comes back to the father and the father lavishes grace and mercy on him, doesn't that teach him to renounce ungodliness? And say, Father, lead me. Don't lead me into temptation. We're weak. I don't want to go back. I don't want to experience what I experienced before. I'm done leading myself. I'm done following my desires. I'm done following my passions. I want to follow you. And see, that's what the grace of God is doing. It's, it's teaching us to renounce that other life and to live a brand new life. So often we think about grace that sets us free from the consequences of sin, but it also sets us free from the lifestyle of sin, from the cycle of sin. So now we know where that ends up, and we don't have to go that way anymore. And this is what we constantly remember when we say, Father, don't lead us into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Number five, he answers this prayer by sending the Holy Spirit 
to lead us. Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 14, for if you live to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. God's Spirit leads us if we will follow him. What does it look like when you're following the Spirit of God? Paul says exactly what it looks like. It looks like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's what it looks like when you're following the Spirit of God. But when you're following your own flesh, it doesn't look anything like that, does it? You can, you can be a religious person. You can, you can come to church on Sundays and, and even on Wednesdays. You can read your Bible and you can say your prayers and still follow your flesh and not follow the Spirit of God. Jesus teaches his disciples, pray this way. Pray, Father, lead us not into temptation. Because the alternative is to follow someone else or follow something else. The alternative is to follow yourself. And we end up in sin. We end up in sin when we are led by our desires rather than by God. You've been there. I've been there. We've all been there. And we don't want to go back, do we? We end up in sin when we are led by our desires rather than by God. So that's what we're praying. We're praying, lead, Father, lead. Lead, carry, bring, take. Not just me, but us. Us, I'm part of a body. I'm part of a flock. And we all need your leading. We're all weak. We're all sinful. We all struggle. Lead us. And Father, don't lead us into temptation. Because we are so very weak. And we want to do what is right and what is good. And if you follow you, you will end up in sin. If you follow the crowd, you will end up in sin. If you follow your own common sense, you will end up in sin. The only way to not end up in sin is to surrender yourself to his leading and follow him. Let's pray, church. Father God, just to call you Father, is such a privilege and an honor that you allow us, in spite of where we've been and what we've done and what we've said, in spite of who we've been, Father, you have adopted us and forgiven us and cleansed us. And we thank you that we are able to address you as our Father. And Father, we pray that your name is hallowed We pray that your will is done. We pray that your kingdom comes. And Father, we pray that you lead us not into temptation. Father, we want to follow you. We want to follow your spirit. We want to follow your will. We want to follow your word. Father, help us not to follow ourselves and our own desires, but to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and to walk by the spirit and not by the flesh. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much, Wes, for that message. Thanks for reminding us so many important things. Maybe some of us hearing for the first time, but for many of us, wonderful reminders that this is a communal prayer and that we are to yield to his leadership in our lives, all aspects of our lives. Thank you so much. That is what a blessing. Again, thanks for being here tonight. Next Wednesday, we will continue. I think we have two more Wednesday nights. Summer is quickly going by, isn't it? Right, students? School starts soon. I can see that excitement on your faces. Yes, we're excited about school. So next week we have Jamie, as his friends call him, James, as strangers I guess call him. Jamie Simmons will be with us. He's with the uh, Inner City Church in Tulsa, the Contact Church of Christ, has a long history with the Park Church in Tulsa. He will be here to continue our series. Some of you know him, great guy. You'll enjoy and be blessed by his message. Again, we have Cookie Fellowship right out in the quad, right out here in just a moment. So we hope that you'll go by, have a cookie, meet someone. If you are a member here, look around, see if you 
have some people around you you don't recognize and introduce yourselves to them. And if they are also members, maybe they go to a different service, that's okay. You'll meet a fellow brother or sister in Christ at Edmond, and maybe they're a guest, and that's even better. You'll meet them. So let's be friendly. Again, thanks for being here. You are dismissed.